Welcome to The Human Way. I am your host, Matt Havens. And on today's episode, I talk with Amy Haggerty, who's the Director of Partnership Strategy at the Cornerstone Foundation. Amy is somebody who does not let herself get too high or too low. And so we talked about how we balance that, how we balance ourselves so that we can be the best for those that we lead. She shares stories about why she jumps in a freezing lake in Chicago in the middle of the winter just to help her shift her perspective. And she also shares a story of what she called the beautiful disaster. You're going to want to hear this. I had a great time with Amy, so let's get rolling. Hey, everybody. Welcome to The Human Way. Amy, I'm happy to have you as a guest. How are you today? I'm doing great, Matt. Super happy to be here with you. I'm, I'm very, very happy that, that we made this happen. Uh, we actually had to reschedule this because of this Texas snowpocalypse, so it's good to, <laughs> good to finally get you back. And, um, and I have to start by saying um, I'm, I'm excited for this conversation because you've already given me a lot of good information to go off of. And what I mean by that is uh, every time I have a guest, I have certainly want to get a, you know, some sort of a, a bio from them so that I can make sure we promote it. And when I got your bio, you did something that I like to do, which is what I call, you gave me the non-standard bio. It wasn't, hi, I'm Amy Haggerty. You know, I've uh, been to these universities. I'm now the director of partnership strategy at Cornerstone. Um, no, instead it was a litany of, like interesting life facts is what I'll call them. And the first one I want to call out is that in your bio, you told me that you came out of the womb pretty happy and well-adjusted. <laughs> um, I like to think I'm happy. I don't know if I'm well-adjusted. So I just wanted to know how did you manage to accomplish that? I, 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 I don't know. And again, I, I think what I have come to realize later in my life is that I, I, I I credit it with my birth. So I think I just sort of came out with some of the right pieces in place that I know now humans have to work really hard on. So I don't, I, I try not to take some of those things for granted. And some of those things being that I, you know, my baseline emotion is sort of easy and happy. I don't experience anger um, very much, almost sometimes to a fault, but um, that's, that's a strange feeling for me. I really like vegetables you know i prefer them <laughs> to um to other food i i am genuinely interested in people and like to talk to people and i think those things so i've learned to build upon those um but i do think that some of those switches you know with all the switches that we just have on um and that can change over time but i just was i think fortunate to get some of those switches in the right place that um Kept me have kept me going through life at a pretty even keel, um, and I describe it as you know the the swings, the up and down swings that all of us encounter in different ways. My swings are are fairly narrow. They they don't go they don't swing super high and they don't swing super low. So I I I'm, I can stay fairly well calibrated, but that also means that when I get out of calibration, I'm also very aware of it because it feels so outside of my standard. Yeah. Um, and that's where then I've worked as more as an adult to figure out, so what are those things that I need to do then to, to get me back into that, um, you know, that sort of more equal calibrated state. But, so, the, go ahead. No, I was gonna say, I, I love that. Yeah. And, and, and very similar sort of personality myself as well. But, uh, but like where you described it, it's like when we get out of, when we get out of those zones, it yeah. does feel so foreign that you're right. It's, it's, yeah. you kind of like, wow, something's off. And, and I, uh, my wife kind of jokes with me cause I'm, I'm pretty even keel. Like, like you don't get too high, do too low. So when I do get too high yeah. or too low, she has to kind of be like, Hey, I know something's not, I know something's not right. Yeah. What's going on. Cause you don't normally do this. So Right. And, and so it's like that self-awareness, but also I think other people can sometimes see it, at least in my situation. Other people can see. You. And we don't necessarily have the experience then growing up, I think, of figuring out what it takes to get out of it. So it almost sends you a little bit more in a spin because you don't know where to go. You haven't, we haven't necessarily developed all those coping skills. But I think what I have found with my, with that even keel is that it gets, it's fairly easy to tweak too. You find the right things to do. For me, it's, you know, making sure I get outside, if listening to the right music, and it, it doesn't take a significant amount to to knock me back in. Sure. Um, but when I'm not in there, everything just feels off. And what I have learned, again, all in this growing older self awareness, I think for us who are default happy and even keel, I think a lot of people depend on that us for that. I know my family that looks to that, and I you sort of you play a certain role 
in people's lives. And then when you get knocked out of that, you see sort of how much your, let's say happiness, because we don't always need to be happy, but your sort of positivity and balance is also relied on by others around you. Um, and that's an, a burden too, but also something that I have helped be aware of that has kept me coming out of those periods of recognizing that like my kids actually need me to be here too. Absolutely. They they need, um, uh, you know, they need me to not be thinking about things as heavily as they are because they're thinkers too, or my husband is a, you know, is a constant thinker. Yeah. Sometimes we need the people that aren't constantly just hashing things over in our brains. We make we, quicker decisions. We need the balance <laughs> of skills and personalities. Absolutely. That's why teams work. Cause you get, you know, you get a mm -hmm. little bit of this, a little bit of that. I, I'm curious though, are you the, t are, are you the type of person that like views things as whether or not you have control over the outcome and, and in the situations yeah. where maybe you don't have control and you recognize that, are you, are you the type that can easily just kind of let that go? Like, oh, I don't have, you know, it's out of my control. I can't really do much about it. So let's, you know, make, let's make a pie out of this. We're just going to make the best of the situation. Is that sort of how you approach things or is it different? No. Yeah. I would say I don't require control of things. I have always um, sort of felt, I, I always felt that my future would, I, I would sort of leave things up to the faith a bit. Um, and I would, if I was in the right place, if I got myself in the right place at the right time, the right thing would happen. And um, that if you make yourself open to opportunities and to connections and to relationships, um, then the, your next steps will appear. Um, so I never controlled too tightly my own narrative. And I think at times I felt badly about that. I always felt, you know, should I be setting more goals? Should I be more disciplined about where and what I'm trying to do with things? And I realized that that's just, yeah, not how I am wired. And I can set intentions for things, but um, if they turn out to be something else, that in most cases that has turned out to be something that has been as fine, if not better, as what the what what I was aiming for in the first place. So um, I don't get too attached to those things. And one thing that I have learned, um, the thing that I have liked and that I like to remind yourself to is that you can't, you know, to not get attached to the outcomes that you can do all you can. You can put in everything that you can do it, but to something, but um, you, you have to, you have to free yourself up and free up the world when it comes to what the outcome is actually going to be. That one's not in your control. Absolutely. Yeah. That's actually something. Um, one of the things we're doing, uh, you know, my, my company and uh, is, working with working with sales organizations i think that's one of the biggest things mm -hmm. for sales is to where where people in sales and this this applies to other industries but particularly in sales when you focus on the outcome when you focus on oh i have to make 10 sales this week or th this month when you focus on the outcome you miss the the part that's most important which is well what work did you put in to get those 10 so if it's sales right mm -hmm. you, it means you got to make 200 contacts with the, with a client or and if you make those 200 your percentages will work out where on average you'll get that 10 but people get too focused on the results so it's something that i've tried to like take in as my own learning you know for for some time now that i can't always control that outcome but i can yeah. control what i do to get there and if i if i do what i need to do generally it's going to work out. So that's, that's mm -hmm. kind of how I let go of control in some regards. Um, yeah. Yeah. You can control what it takes to get there and then you control your response to it afterwards. Your response. Afterwards. Um, yep. And that's, that is, uh, you know, I think really sort of what the meaning is in life there is, is how you respond. Um, and that's whether you make life easier or harder on yourself. Absolutely. So there, there's another thing in your bio that I have to at least just ask about, uh, because another thing you said is that you like jumping into the frigid uh, waters of <laughs> Lake Michigan. But specifically, you said as a way to immediately shift your perspective, which I love. Mm -hmm. um, so tell me a little bit about that. How long have you been doing this? Why are you doing it? <laughs> yeah, all very good questions. Um, my mother thinks I'm insane. Uh, but so we, I, I do spend a lot of time on the lake in Lake Michigan. I um, was born in this area and then was gone for many, many years and then came back. And I've lived in places where I've been close to the ocean and on other bodies of water, but I, I really have come to use Lake Michigan more so than I have at any other point around water. It is, it, you can, it is such an undervalued part of our world out here and it really functions like an ocean. 
um, without salt in it, which is like an added benefit. Um, so we have, since I've been living back here and near the lake, we've, I picked up paddleboarding. Um, even before I went started paddleboarding in COVID summer too, but so we've been doing that for a while and have loved it. And it really is that sort of the first perspective shift, being able to be out on the water and look back out at our town and our land um, from the perspective of the lake is has changed my perspective of living in the Midwest in general. It just makes you not feel land mass bound. Um, and it just gives you open space that you is hard to find anywhere else, right? It just is so much space where there's nothing there. So the access to the water and getting out on the water has been it's been amazing itself. Um, last summer, in particular, a lot more people started doing it. A lot more women in my area started doing it. So we we, you know, have this had this great group of women that would go out um, early mornings around the weekends. And what we found, one of the one of those silver linings of COVID was that um, we were driving so much less, right? We weren't schlepping our kids all over. We weren't spending our Saturdays at soccer games, um, you know, picking up from sleepovers, all the things that, you know, all of the parents do. Um, so we had these windows of time that became ours again. So Saturday morning, we could go out from seven to noon and no one would miss us. Um, and we could go after work. So it, that, you know, it was sort of a second level of perspective shifting of we just got this time back to claim for ourselves yeah. um, and spend with these, with these amazing women. So it is all a lead up to say that when the weather started shifting, there was a group of us that didn't want to give up the lake. Um, and so we started just by dunking in and that was in September and we thought we were kind of badass then because it was like a little <laughs> bit cold. Um, and then we kept doing it and we would take videos of ourselves and say what the date was. Um, and we just kept on doing it maybe once a week or so. And it got to a point that we would go down in our, you know, full coats and hats and, and um, boots and everything. And we would be on the lake. We would um, strip down. We did it in bathing suits. We didn't do it in wetsuits or anything. There would be a, a few people around that looking at us like we're crazy. Um, and we would go in the water for, and it's not for very long, maybe a minute or two. Um, but you have to, the whole philosophy, and there's this whole this Wim Hof, if anyone knows of Wim Hof, there is, a, um, there is a whole cold exposure theory and philosophy that really has been shown to treat anxiety, depression, all physical ailments. But the, the crux of it is that if you can control your autonomic nervous system, I think what it's called, like if you can control your breathing, if you could not freak out when you are plunged into a ice pool or bath, then you can put yourself in the most stressful of situations and you, you have the tools then to, to, to calm yourself um, and eventually find a pleasure, you know, if find pleasure in it. So we um, did it up through, I don't remember what the last date was, January something. And then, um, I, you know, it, we, that Chicago just you know, yeah. went haywire with the snow, everything. So we couldn't even access the lake anymore. So um, we did it probably through mid-January. Now, my, my mother, who has thought I'm crazy the whole time, has it just sent me, um, brought over the cover of the Chicago Sun-Times from last week. And uh, the cover story was three women in Chicago, in the city, who had been doing it every single day throughout the entire winter with a pickaxe. They would go out and they would carve a hole in the lake and then go in it. And so even with what I'm doing, I mean, I, that's crazy. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I love how you could call um, them crazy, even though totally. even though you're basically doing the same thing. <laughs> but their description of it, it really was a, it was a beautiful article because they got into, you know, how sort of their decision why to do it and one woman's husband had died from COVID and how she just really needed something to sort of keep her going through it but it would be for all of us the group the, the few women that I was doing is that we would hit a point in our day in the winter and it was gray and we just we craved it and we knew that if, if I just could jump in there I would come out feeling different yeah. um, it just shocks every part of you and it 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 sort of turns you on your head and your day afterwards has to be different then from it. 
So that was the part that we really all learned to love of that. Like once you got out, you felt just phenomenal afterwards. And that like endorphin rush stuck with you. So, so what, what, what I love about that story is that, um, a you're crazy and that's totally cool. And I, yeah. like, I like crazy. Right. But, um, so I didn't, so I didn't, I didn't tell you this, but I do the same thing. <laughs> um, oh. and so I'm, the frigid, I'm waters of Texas? the frigid waters of Texas, like we, but where we, I only get like a one month period where it's going to be cold enough to feel like you're really doing something like that. It's certainly not like yeah. pickaxes on Lake Michigan or anything like that. But what I love about the story is like how everybody can find a different reason or idea behind it that just either makes them happy, gives them comfort, does something right. Like I, I do it because it actually helps my back feel better. Like the, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. that that's a big thing that I like to do. So I do it in the month of January, uh, because it's cold enough here in Texas to do that then. But you're right. The other thing is like, when you get out of that water, you, I have now, if, if, when I normally do it, I normally do it pretty early in the morning, like five thirty six in the morning. And if I do it, then I'm, I am wide awake. I'm ready to start my day. And in my opinion, I might, I've probably already been through the worst part of my day. I've been through yeah. the hardest minute or so that I'm probably going to face today. So now it's like, well, the rest of the day, we'll just, we'll get through it. It's no problem at all. Yeah. Cause I've already stuck myself yeah. in 30 degree water for a minute, but <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Okay. So you're a believer. I'm a, I'm yeah. a believer. I'm a believer as well. Um, it's definitely, I wish I had access to it more than I do living down here. I but. know. Well, now, so you can get a standing refrigerator that people are making ice baths in their basement, which just sounds like a sure way to flood your basement. In my mind, but, <laughs> um, and that, then you turn them into your own little baths. But that, sounds like that seems like too much work for me, <laughs> but. <laughs> I, would be, I would be totally down for it. Um, mm -hmm. Well, hey, an another another question I kind of wanted to ask you, unrelated to your bio, but um, yeah, you know, what one of the things that I, in reaching out to you beforehand and, and talking about this, one of the things I, I do ask a, a lot of my guests is this idea of um, like some failures that we've had. Nothing, you know, mm -hmm. I, I my goal is to try to change people's perspective of the word failure because I think it's holding back a lot of people. I think it's holding back a lot of organizations because we view failure in negative terms. And I, I think if we try to think of it more positively and as something we learn from and something that newsflash every single one of us does, then, mm -hmm. you know, that's going to help progress the conversation is going to make us better leaders if we try to embrace it more. Um, and so when I kind of like set that up for you um, beforehand, one of the things you said to me is, oh, I've got a story. My family calls it the beautiful disaster. <laughs> so I am dying to now know, can you please tell us what the beautiful disaster is and, and what you've maybe learned from it or, or what that experience was? Yes, I would be happy to. And it's kind of a long story, um, but I don't get to tell it very often. So I will. Um, it is a time of life that I really I do I love talking to about. So, OK, let's let's lay this out. So I um, my at, I, at my job, um, I was fortunate enough, which was just the greatest gift a company could ever give anyone um, is we get sabbaticals at seven years after we worked there for seven years. Um, and it's a huge thing, you know, everyone's counting down to the sabbatical. So I hit that about two or three summers ago, I think it was the summer of 2017. Um, and we decided to do an RV trip, my family, which is something that my husband and I had talked about since the day we met it was one day we're going to, you know, take off in an RV. And we still talk about it one day later in life, we are going to take off in an RV. I'm dying to see that Nomadland movie, um, with <laughs> to see what she does. But um, so we uh, decided that's what we were going to do. Our kids um, were a perfect age for it. I think they were about seven and eleven at that time, so they were physically small enough still to fit in these, you know, in the RV that we we got. And we took um, so we had. I think I got seven weeks off. So we took. We planned a six week a six week RV trip um, out west. And I am the travel planner for our family. Um, and got everything in place and really uh, made it a mix of plans and no plans because I can only operate with so many plans in my life and then I start panicking, um, which was a tricky balance to know what you had to plan and what you didn't. And, you know, traveling through the national parks in the middle of the summer, you, you got to do some planning. You, you got to do a little that. bit. 
yeah, there's a lot of other people out there trying to do the same thing. So, um, so we had put things in place. Everything had worked great so far. We were probably three weeks in, and the combination of planning, no planning, had just had worked out beautifully. Um, we made our way up to Banff. So we had gone through sort of the Western United States. We got up into Canada. We were in Banff, and then there's this um, a mountain that you take, I feel like it was a chairlift or something to the top of. And again, this is the middle of the summer. And you you are right in the midst of the Colorado, the, the Canadian Rockies. And it's so gorgeous, such an amazing spot. And now this was, there were two things that sort of complicated this time and the factor up there. One being is that that summer, um, the fires in Canada were horrific. So Everywhere we were was literally on fire and we were at this amazing place on top of this mountain with this amazing view and we really couldn't see a foot in front of our face. Um, and it also, that summer happened to be, it was like the bicentennial or some centennial of Canadian parks. So Canada was packed and on fire. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> two good um, combinations there. Totally. So, I, but again, we had our, this was sort of the beginning of our track. We were in Banff. We were going to go farther up north. We had all of this, you know, the next two weeks planned, which was sort of the end of our trip, the, the last half of our trip, all revolved around Banff and Jasper and all this area in our van. So we're on this, on the top of the mountain. I pull up my phone and the itinerary to figure out where we needed to be for our campsite. We had sort of, we would go into the woods and then out of the woods. We had been out of the woods for a little bit. And then this next period, we were going to spend a week or so in the woods. And I pulled up the reservation and I realized that the all of the next reservations I had made were for the following month. <laughs> not that night, which I thought it was going to be, but the following month. And I don't want to say this is not totally off brand for me. Like I am, while I am our itinerary and our family planner, I'm very bad with days and months. <laughs> um, always. And I, I mean, never once have I showed up at, uh, at the airport or at a hotel and like given them a reservation and not expected them to tell me that I made it for the wrong time. Only happens rarely, but like I, that's always what I think. It's just, a, it's just in your head. Yeah. <laughs> it's in my head. Um, and there's certain months, you know, especially like the July, August, September, they just, they sort of <laughs> throw all numbers to me. Um, so I remember sitting on the floor, my husband and kids were sort of out exploring other areas and they came back and they just saw my face was just white as a sheet. And um, I told them what happened. And I, it's, we are, I, you know, I, I, I think often of my parents sometimes or other families and stuff that that's reason for people to start yelling at each other and like blaming and, uh, and all of that. And that's just not in our DNA. That's not how we do it. But I, I mean, you know, I have this one up. Um, but the next question was, okay, so what are we gonna do? What, you know, what do we do next? And, um, everything in the whole area was booked and also on fire, but booked more important, <laughs> booked more importantly, because <laughs> there were so many people there. So we started calling around, we were looking, we knew we needed, um, to be somewhere where we had Wi-Fi because we need to, we needed to like reorganize the whole trip. So the only place that really was available in Banff at that time was um, the Fairmont Banff. Have you ever been to Banff? I have never been, no. no. I would love to. But. Okay, so even from when you're up, when you're on this hill, you look down and it's a beautiful little town and there is a castle in the middle of it, like a legit medieval looking <laughs> castle. It's amazing. This is the Fairmont Banff. Um, and it was the only place that really had availability at that time. And we said, you know, we have been in the woods for weeks. We need one nice night to like figure out how to save the rest of this trip. So we pulled our van in, we walked, we were like Linus coming in with like clouds of dirt all behind <laughs> us. You know, we were scrounging for quarters under the, under our seats to pay for this night in the hotel. And we had just the most magnificent evening where um, you know, my kids were cannonballing into the pool. They fell asleep in their robes, eating, you know, uh, room service. And then my husband and I, me really, he was support, but I stayed up all night reconfiguring the whole trip and figuring out, well, you know, it, it was a full pivot. Like everything was, it had to change. So what we ended up doing was deciding to, for the last 
part of the trip that we wanted to hit the ocean. Like that there was never going to be any part of the trip, but we wanted to hit the ocean. And the ocean is pretty far away from us, yeah. turns out, geographically. So we hightailed it out of the mountains. We drove through the Rockies, Canadian Rockies being, I mean, t- even 10 times more impressive than the, the U.S. Rockies. Just amazing. And drove through fires. Like there, I mean, we were, things were burning on either side of us as we were driving through some of these mountains. Um, we eventually made it to Vancouver. We had, I had booked a um, ferry ride to get to Vancouver Island. All of these things and doing my research, I thought sounded very sort of quaint and small. The ferry was the size of like a cruise ship. Vancouver Island was about the size of Texas. I mean, everything, I, I was thinking little islands that we were going to. Um, um, so we still had a very far way to go. We, uh, we drove five hours across Vancouver Island to finally make it to the ocean where we all just ran into the ocean together, had this amazing combination of a trip where we really felt like there was an ending to it because we made it to, uh, to a destination that never would have been there in the first place. Um, and that whole second half of the trip, it, it because you know, we approached it as an opportunity of what can we do with this now um, ended to be, I think, better than we could have planned in the first place. And we were aware of that as being a lesson to our kids, even as we were living it. Um, But one that they saw on their own, I mean, they, they really internalized that the, they called it mommy's beautiful disaster Um, because thank God I made that mistake because it ended up with two weeks really of just a perfect perfectly unplanned planning um, that we, we couldn't have, you know, we wouldn't have come up otherwise with. So that was, that was our beautiful disaster, our lessons learned. And, um, you know, the lessons learned there was sort of exactly where we started out too, is um, you, you can't control everything. So what's the, what's the best plan B? And often if you're open to it, plan B can turn out better than plan A. Absolutely. What I, what I, what it made me think of is I, I think I saw this on social media or something maybe later the, earlier this week, but it's, you know, if you ever, if you ever ask somebody like, well, what happened or how's it's going? And, and their answer is, well, you know, it is what it is. Like those yeah. are the dangerous people because those people have it figured out that, you know, well, it is what it is and they're going to, they're going to turn it into something and it's probably going to be more mm-hmm. amazing than it was uh, b- before that. And that's exactly kind of what your, yeah. <laughs> what your story is. It's you can't control this and, but we're here and we're together and we're, we're yeah. healthy. We're happy. Let's, let's see what we can do. I mean, like you're talking about driving through fires. Like, are you, is, were you ever in danger of like get, getting caught with some of these or getting stuck? Like, cause you don't even know yeah, the terrain. So like you could just be driving. Yeah, just, maybe. Like, who knows? Could have. <laughs> Could have. <laughs> didn't. didn't. So <laughs> it well, was I'm... okay. I mean, it was, it was scary though. But, and that was, I think, you know, those are things, especially with kids you know, when you really realize that they are watching and they see all of that, you know, you see how much they would internalize had that been a different way. Had my husband, you know, yelled at me and they hit me because I screwed up, you know, like there's, there is just that added layer of that is how you, you know, you, you have to be an example for how you want to raise your kids. And if it, um, they see all of that. Um, so Oh, they do. You know, way, way better to make that, a, you know, a positive experience for everyone. Um, people are going to screw up all the time. I used to miss it. The other date related thing that I used to do is I used to, um, I used to miss kids' birthday parties. And I never really felt that bad. Like, who needs another birthday party? But it, <laughs> what I would always say to my kids when they would be upset to realize that I had totally forgotten that one of their friends' birthday parties that day was, look at all the things that I do right. You know, I get most of these things right. Something's going to slip. If it's a birthday party, fine. But like, let's look at the things that I don't miss. Yeah. <laughs> and I, that just makes life a little easier. I had a similar conversation with one of my daughters uh, this weekend, actually, because uh, we decided to go for like a long walk. It was something that um, I used to do with with my folks, with my parents. Uh, would go on these like long walks around the block. And as a kid, I really looked forward to them. It was like, Mm. Um, my time, I have two older brothers. So it was my time with mom and we would, you know, she would basically just listen and I would probably tell her all the things that I shouldn't be telling her and that she was, you know, used to hold against me. But, um, so, uh, I would say one of my daughters is pretty headstrong right now. She's seven. 
she has the world figured out. And so mm -hmm. um, she was kind of just, you know, really going, we, we had said no to something. I don't even remember what it was. And, uh, but she was really kind of just stuck on that. So I was like, Hey, let's go for a walk. And we decided that she agreed and uh, I yeah. didn't have to force her out of the house, but we, uh, we started going for a walk. And as we got talking, she was, and you know, she was removed from the situation. She was in a little bit of a better mood. We started talking about that. Like, Hey, you know, sometimes mom and mom and dad are going to say no. Right. And just like you said, like, sometimes I, sometimes I get things wrong, but I get it right. And like, I reminded mm -hmm. her, I was like, how many times do mom and dad say yes to the things that you yeah. want? <laughs> and, yeah. and then there she was, she's like, you say yes a lot. And you know, she kind of started naming stuff and I was like, all right. So She's like, but you say no a lot too. And it was like, <laughs> yes, I do. You know, as your parent, yes, I have to say no sometimes. But let's think about all the times I do get it right. We do say mm -hmm. yes. And uh, it yeah. was like this nice that little is. like aha moment where you think like, oh, maybe I got through to this seven-year-old. Maybe this yeah. was the moment right. that they uh, will, will remember for life. <laughs> Only for a minute. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, one of them. Yeah, oh God, you never know. That's what I would say. Like you, you know, you never know what's going to stick yeah. with the kids. And you never know what, you know, it's, it, we will screw them up somehow. We just don't know what, you know, you never know what it's, it's going to be. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely messing my kids up more than I'm probably helping them, but, um, but that's yeah. me and not for, not for you. I'm sure you guys are doing it better. Um, <laughs> so, but, so I love, I also love this idea that uh, what the company sabbatical, you know, seven weeks off, yeah. that's, that's an amazing, amazing perk it to have. Is amazing. It is. I really, I mean, I felt it so tangibly of how important it is for mid career, you know, in particular, like at this stage to be able to just walk away and reset. Um, and it did exactly what it was supposed to be. I was sort of burned out before. Um, I was able to come back and I was rejuvenated. I wanted to be there. Um, I was so grateful that I had the opportunity to do it. And we don't get that choice. I mean, as women, you get maternity leave, but that's not a break. Um, you know, and the men are getting more maternity, paternity leaves now too. But again, that's always around a purpose is always around someone else to be able to have some time where you're just able to reset and choose what those, what that period of time looks like, um, really was a, was a huge gift. Um, there's a, I, I just found, I don't remember the name of it, but there was a foundation that, um, they, what they did, they fund sabbaticals for nonprofit executives. Um, they recognize with all the data and, you know, it's all data driven of how critical it is really for individuals and their long term success in an organization. So they fund executive directors to be able to take sabbaticals from the jobs, which a nonprofit would normally not be able to support. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. So let, let's talk about that a little bit. Like, um, you know, I don't want to inundate you with questions about work, but uh, for, for those that, that 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 don't know you or just the first time they're getting a chance to talk with you. Um, you're, you're the director of partnership strategy at Cornerstone Foundation. So can you tell people yeah. a little bit about what that, what type of work you're doing and, and the idea of yeah. how that foundation helps nonprofits? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we are a foundation. We are the philanthropic arm of Cornerstone On Demand, the company, which is a leading SaaS talent management platform. So um, a learning management system, performance management, succession planning, sort of front of the house, HR tools. Um, we have been around for, the company has been around, God, probably for about 20 years now. The foundation has been around for about 11. And the foundation was formed. We are, we are different than a standard um, is CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility Program, different from foundations, many foundations in, in organizations, and in that we don't give money. We were really set up to um, donate our the software services expertise um, to within our ecosystem, within the Cornerstone ecosystem to nonprofits. Um, and that looks like a variety of different things. So we have given t um, grants to nonprofits to be able to use the software. We leverage our um, Cornerstone employees and our employee base to provide pro bono support and volunteering services, skilled volunteer hours to our partners or to other nonprofits. Um, and we also now have developed, um, which is really our focus of our of our foundation, now what we call our, our ready platforms. And that is nonprofitready.org, disaster ready, um, and workforce ready.org. And those are open online learning platforms where we use the cornerstone technology for that. And um, 
we curate or build content, learning content for nonprofit professionals, for humanitarian disaster relief workers, um, and for underrepresented job seekers to help them um, find jobs, do their jobs better, advance in their career. So it's all free online training um, that is aimed at those at those um, at, at those audiences. And then in my role, I've had a lot of different roles in that, but now I really I've, I've always been on sort of the partner client management side where I work with the nonprofits that either are benefiting from our software that are donating content for these portals or that we're working with in some you know, form of partnership or other. So it's a, it is a unique organization. It is an amazing place to be and to have been for these past years. Um, I've been there for now 10 years. Um, and just it's in that sort of in-between space of, of being part of a larger for-profit company but being on the side of really being able to focus those resources, both from financial and um, human resources, for the greater good. Um, and I have I've loved that space. That's really allowed, um, you know, I think me to have security and stability in the job, but and then also really feel like we are in a position to make a difference, um, both for nonprofit organizations and uh, in individuals that work for them, and then the individuals that they serve. Yeah. So, that's a cool place to be. I so yeah, and, and I, I love the idea of it because I don't, I, you know, I don't know that a the nonprofit world as, as itself. I don't think a lot of people understand all the times how they work, and of course, like there's mm -hmm. you know money that they need to be raising to run, and generally you know set up to do some type of good um, in, in yep. a variety of industries or topics, whatever you may want to call it. But what I what I really love about kind of the work you do and and the foundation is. You're also allowing then those organizations to still develop their people to yeah. have access to these types of tools because you know what we hear today is so much and i think this i might have even seen something um on, on the website about this right is like when people give a hundred dollars to an organization or a thousand dollars they want there's so much effort or emphasis on well what is that thousand dollars what doing? is it going to what is and yep. it, it, i want it going to this cause that i'm giving to but you're still going to have to spend some of money to train the people that are working at that nonprofit or um, help give them development and, and things like that. And that's the, that's the gap that, that I think yeah. you get to help fill that people don't necessarily think, see about how that always works. So it's a it really cool Absolutely. concept and idea. Absolutely. And that was really what sort of one of the original tenants that it was built on because that, you know, in the nonprofit and philanthropy world, it's changing a bit now, but that was always seen as overhead, right? You know, and you don't want your money going to overhead. You want your money going to the programs and going on the ground. Well, there is no programs. There's no saving people's lives if you don't have skilled people, you know, in place to do it that are getting a competitive salary and are able to develop themselves to a point that they want to stay with the organization. And it's really, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things backwards with how, um, how the nonprofit sector works and what nonprofits have to contend with that is just so different from a for-profit that can go out and raise money um, and, you know, pay benefits and stock, stock bonuses and all of that. Um, it's, it is it's um, it is a flawed. There's a lot of flaws to the system. There are organizations and there are people that are trying to shift that, but it is a um, you know it is based on on tenets and belief and a system that is that is unequal, and some of it perpetuates that. It doesn't always you know what we're trying to solve is sort of created sometimes by the inequity at the beginning. So there's some amazing organizations going out there um, out there and. But it's just out. It's up against a lot. It is not easy to be successful as a nonprofit, and it is hard to be a person who is working and you know, just for a cause and for a mission, but being undercut at every stage with, you know, not believing that not not being seen as someone that's worth um, developing and you know really uh, growing as an employee as an individual. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. It's just, yeah, it's, it's, uh, th those are those are absolutely tough. Um, it, it's like a, it's like a tough mindset. I think that people are gonna that we that needs to be, that needs to change too. But um, the thing that one of the things that's interesting, I, at least my perception of you a little bit in in our conversations, that is um, 
you're doing you're doing like some really cool work and and i think there's lots of people that are gonna be listening to this that are saying oh my gosh that sounds like amazing i would love to do that you get to work in this nonprofit world but also you know get to get to work with a larger organization as well too Mm -hmm. and have some uh, some cool opportunities there as well but one of the things that at least i pick up on on about you and you can tell me if i'm wrong on this is that despite doing some really really cool work like you don't define yourself (laughs) by your work um, and you, and you, and you, you made, you made a few, a few comments here and they're like, yeah, oh, I'm happy to, happy to talk about work, but like, I'm also happy to just talk about the personal side. And I think that's really cool because so many of us get caught up in what we do for work that it that kind of defines who we are. We, we define yeah. ourselves as, oh, I am a, uh, I, I'm a CEO of a company or I am a manager at X company. How, so one, am I am I are, am I slightly on base with with my perception? But two, if so, like what? How do you balance that? Like how do you balance that? Obviously, very successful career, very good at what you do, and still balance that with well, I'm at the end of the day, I'm still Amy Haggerty. Yeah, yeah. I mean, again, I I put some of that to that 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 adjustment coming out of the womb yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, of that just inherent belief that I, it was never going to be about what I do. And I, I, you know, I was on, I was on the success in the track, you know, fast track growing up of the AP courses and the Ivy league school and all of that. But, and I knew that I couldn't sign up for everything else that was coming along with that, that I was seeing with other people, which was, you know, knowing exactly what I was going to do next and having a goal of this much money or this type of role by this, this period of time. It just was never how I saw life. And I knew that I was going to need to take a little bit more time to even figure out what that was like. And, you know, I, I had the, the, the privilege and the, the luxury to be able to do so and to take some time to figure out what my professional path would be and how that would play out. And it, I never would have, you know, thank God I didn't have set goals of what exactly I wanted to be this job. Who would have known that a job like this existed? Um, they, it, they just sort of become available as the technology change. I started in technology and at the right time in life um, and place, you know, San Francisco, 1999. So yeah, good, I, that was a good time to hit the technology world. It, it was a great time to hit technology. It was a great time to be in San Francisco. And it just was the start of all of these, you know, companies. And um, so it took time and I never, I always had interesting jobs. I really did, but no one ever knew what I did um, because I, I, it just, I don't know, is not what I talk about and not what I wanted to talk about, but it was always so always complicated. I always joke that I, I always <laughs> had a sort of desire and it was always a dentist. I wish I was a dentist so then I could move somewhere and I could look on whatever it was at the time, you know, I always remember thinking it like monster.com days or in the lawn ads or whatever. And I'd say, I want to be a dentist in Omaha, you know, and you could define that. I never had a job that had meaning to anyone beyond sort of what it was that I was doing. So um, it was always just a little, it was hard to talk about. Um, And for me, even within the job, what I would talk about is the it was always the relationship. So it, even when I talked about my job or when I thought about what drove me in my job, it wasn't what I was doing. It was the connections that I was forming, whether it was with my colleagues um, or partners or clients or, you know, whoever I was working with at the time. And that was what formed the job for me. Um, Even if the job could look very different, the consistent part was that it was, it, for me, it was about the human relationships of it. Um, and so that in itself sort of makes it seem less job-like for me. Um, and it, it, that's, you know, that's what, how I define the importance of my job. And then I also, it's funny, we were just talking with someone at, on our team, Paul, who had this, had a, had a picture of sort of, as you think of your life, and his whole point was that, you know, your job is one part of it, but he described it as a portfolio and that how you think about the portfolio of your time and what you associate time with. And then it looks different at the different times of life. If you are, you know, if you're single, if you have kids, if you're, you know, retired, but that 
you know, keeping a, a, a view of what the parts of the portfolio are and making sure they are sort of relatively in check and right sized relative to where you are that is, is sort of the key to it. And that struck me because I think that's, um, that, that jives with how I look at things. The job's always a part, um, and, but there's many other parts. And the thing that sort of combines all the lens through really is the, is the people um, along the way. I mean, that's beautiful. I so I love this idea of the portfolio of time. Um, I think that's really important for people to understand, take notice of in their own, in their own life, in their own situation. Um, you know, where are you spending your time and does that vibe with where you want to be and who you Wanna are? Be. And, um, mm -hmm. and sometimes it's not, sometimes it's out of whack and that's okay. Uh, we're in control of putting that back into the right place. But, you know, one of the things I talk, a, I talk a lot about, um, is, like I, be, I believe there is a, the, the idea of work-life balance is kind of actually non-existent. And what I mean mm -hmm. by that is we, we used to, I think, put work in our personal lives in vastly separate buckets. And, you know, you clock in, you go to work from nine to five, you clock out, and then you go hang out with your personal friends, you know, and you don't intertwine the yeah. two. Um, but what, what you just described, and, and we can still even sometimes think of that. We can still think of it like, well, I, I got like my work life and I have my personal life and that's, that's fine. But my argument, right, is like, it's so who you are at work should be the same person that you are at home. And those relationships that we have at work, they're, they're not just going to end because you don't happen to be at work. Like life is about these relationships, these connections, this community. And, and I think that's kind of what you're describing a little bit too, is it didn't matter the specific job. It was about, mm -hmm. well, what, what is this a community I like? Are these, is, are these relationships that I'm invested in? And if so, then yeah, I love what I'm doing and I'll, yeah. I'll be open to whatever these opportunities. Um, but I did want to ask you kind of a question about that because you're also somebody that has worked remotely for, I think the last 15 years or so. So how... Yeah. And now, and we've obviously got so many people that are working remotely, maybe for the first time, or now they're a year in to, to, to figuring this thing out. How do you, like, how do you maintain those relationships? How do you build that sense of community, uh, particularly from somebody who's experienced this remote working for a much longer period of time? Like, you know, I'm, I'm looking for, I'm looking for the tips or the tricks or the things yeah. that will help people um, kind of live yeah. that. What's been your experience doing that for, for so long? I know. It's not easy. And I do think that it, you know, it definitely allowed this recent shift to virtual to be, you know, it, it wasn't much of a jump for me because I've been used to it. It's been interesting to watch people adapt to it that came from the far other end of it. Um, I, I, you know, uh, the in-person part still is key. You know, if we don't all go back when we can to at least once in a while meeting up, you know, whether it's for the, the several day retreat or the in-person training session, or even just, you know, be able to have dinner and drinks like that, that part, it has become abundantly clear. You can't discount that. Um, and that we lose things if we really will remove that entirely. So it's because those, those are the little boosts that then allow you to go back to being virtual and carry yourself for the next three months on the relationships of when you last saw each other. So I, I do hope, you know, and not hope, I, I know those parts will come back. I hope we haven't gotten to the point, you know, of realizing that we could cut enough budget that we could, you know, we don't need it. We can, we can discount. No, we still, better. we still so, need it. We still need it. I'm on that, I'm on that board too. <laughs> still need it. And that's what, you know, and we still need to go on business trips. Like I, 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 if you, for some people, you need a night away. Um, <laughs> I need a night. Of, is, I need a night where my kids don't wake me up. So, like that's what business trips are. Yeah, it's a, it's one yeah, night of guaranteed yeah. sleep. <laughs> I used to call it. It was a working mom's dirty little secret that those business trips were life saving. Um, but you know that said, you are also still really able to develop real relationships with people virtual. Um, I, you know, we should actually be asking our kids how to do that best. Um, but the video part is, is um, I think, an important ad, although I think it also, it, we've hit an interesting point now that sometimes not having video on and just talking to someone on the phone almost feels more intimate. Um, so I think we need to 
recognize and learn when's the right time for a Zoom call and when's the right time for a phone call um, and that those are different. And we need to just be human. Like you, you need to make up for the time where you would be running into each other in the hallways or over beer or something. And know that, that those conversations and the getting to know each other and the checking in on each other and what's your life like, what in, you know, what's your quarantine world like, like that is, it's not an aside. It's not, you know, as a, a, a step along the way to get to the real business. Like that's the business um, that will allow you to get the work done. So, and not everyone, you know, I've, I've done enough of the personality tests and everything to know that I'm the person, you know, I am the type, the personality type that needs those 10 to 15 minutes first, just chatting before we get into work. But I also know that there's people that that drives them crazy. Um, so some of it is knowing what people need. But even if that's not your MO, if you, you know, are, it is it is still, it is life saving um, because that is what you have to rely. If you can't rely on a foundation of a, of a relationship, um, in doing work virtual, then the work just gets, you know, a whole lot harder. And, and it becomes, it becomes the only thing, you know, the, the work really becomes the, the only, thing, only, you have. On, only thing you have. And so I, I love that. I mean, be, be human. And we have those moments where maybe it's an in-person and you go for the walk of, to go get a coffee and you get to chat about, yeah. you know, nonsense, whatever. Like we have to recreate that in the virtual world if we're not, and it can be done, like you said, and, and. The variety of mediums right it can be a quick check-in it can be a phone call it can be a text message yeah. but just checking in on each other and building yeah. those relationships it's going to be a little bit harder i think virtually or remote um and yeah. you know and a lot of i think of as we continue to fight the virus and uh it, we'll we'll see a return to some type of uh more normalcy of, of work but i mean i also think that there's going to be a lot of remote work that's here for that's, that's a lot around. longer that we weren't anticipating yeah. two years ago that these would be remote positions. So we've got to yeah. get, uh, and we've got access to so much more of each other's lives now. And that's what, you know, you, so you see each other's kids and their dogs and cats climbing all over things and you know, what's in their background. So it is this veil I think has been lifted back to your point of that. We've got work people and we've got life people like, well, we, our work people have been invited into our living rooms and dining mm -hmm. rooms. Um, and I think there's a beauty to that. Like, I really think that that shows, it, it just breaks that down. of showing that like, we all are humans. There's, you know, shit going on in all of our backgrounds. <laughs> I, I, um, Amy, you're a hundred percent, a hundred percent right. And I, you know, I, I don't want to try to say that, uh, you know, the, the COVID has had positive things that's happened. That's not the right mentality. Right. But, mm -hmm. but if there is some silver lining to it, I think because of what we've all had to experience from a working environment, you've said, like, just like you said, it's made people realize that at the end of the day, when we have to go home and, and we're working, we're just people. We've got the same, yeah. people, you know, we got the same kids knocking on the door that want to come in and, and say <laughs> hi and, and you're on a call or, you know, we've yeah. got the hilarious yeah, videos. This, this, I learned this, this, yeah. it, this, I and mean, you can't do this on the podcast. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I love it. Well, Amy, I want to uh, look, we've been talking for a while now. I want to thank you for your time. I, there's a ton in here. I think the audience can, can, can learn from, um, and, and, and I'm, I'm greatly appreciative of your time. Thank you so much, um, for joining us here today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. This is the highlight of my day. Now I got to go back to work. <laughs> I know it's been, it's been a lot of fun for everybody who's listening. Um, please just remember, continue to subscribe, like download, do all the stuff that you're supposed to with that. Um, but I think what we've learned here today is just remember for yourself to others, be a good human today and we'll see you next time.